Let's pray, guys, and then uh, get started. Holy Father in heaven, we are so thankful for the opportunity and the that you are showing us. We are thankful that you have given us this moment again to study. We better prepare for your second coming this Holy Sabbath. May we thus, Lord, we pray in Jesus Christ's holy name. Amen. Now, uh, last time, uh, uh, we were able to see the concept of is God calling me? And, and that concept of is God calling me into marriage was basically bringing to us the concept of let thy will be done. Now, you need to understand that when you are getting into marriage, it should not be your will being done, but God's will. So I need that concept to sink. It is not about me. It's not about my desires. It's not about my chemistry, body chemistry. It's about, is it God's will? Now, so someone will say, but brother, why are you saying that? Because uh, there are churches now, and the Bible says that there are people who contend that men should not, that certain men should not marry according to prophecy, and we apply that to the papal church. Are you trying to tell us that uh, God again can tell someone not to marry? Certainly, yes. Uh, there are people, for example, Jeremiah, he never married. So there are people who can have direct a communication from God, perhaps not to marry for good reasons, but marriage is from the Lord. So, uh, except God is not limited, and not everyone is called of God at some particular point of time to marry. What I mean is, God might have called me to marry, but not now, perhaps in the next four or five years. But I want to insist that this is the time my agents are getting married, people are forming families, they have children, I have to get married. And that's why we ask ourselves the question, is God calling me into marriage? Very pertinent question that needed to be answered. Is God calling me to marriage? And that was basically building on the concept, is it the will of God? And that is where we quote the scripture, let thy will be done. And we realize that if we enter into marriage God's way, then actually we enjoy the fullness of the joy that God had promised to us through his son, Jesus Christ, where Christ himself prayed that his joy, the joy of the Father, might fill us. We might be full with uh, 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 the joy of the Father. And now I want you to also remember why Satan is doing everything he can. Remember, we sort of talked about that earlier. Satan is doing everything he can to unite two incompatible you, two incompatible man and woman. Now, leave alone the extremes of, of lesbianism and homosexuality and the mess that is in the church today. There are a lot of things that have brought confusion into marriage. I'll tell you, one of them is women ordination in the church. The moment women ordination was brought in, not primarily from some day Adventists, other churches that accepted women ordination basically lost it in family life because then the submission aspect began to die away because they did understand that the, the family set up was a basic structure of how the gospel uh, 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 should be like. And it, it was a prototype of what the gospel looks like. So from the family, you would learn much about the church and from the family, you would learn much about the father and his only begotten son. So it's very important to understand that Satan knows of two things that he must attack in the end of time. And one of them is the Sabbath. So if Satan can attack the Sabbath, he can, he can attack the Sabbath, he can attack marriage. And these two are very key because you realize that marriage, when marriage is confused, we definitely will have a wrong understanding of God. I'm just mentioning that in passing. Because God says that man and woman created he in the image and likeness of God. So in understanding the creation of man and woman, we understand the relationship between the father and the son. First Corinthians chapter 11 tells us that the head of Christ is the father. And the head of man is Christ. And man is the head of the woman. So you can be able to see that structure, family structure, and that the theocracy, that structure, well, uh, 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 the father rather, is, uh, is the head of the son, uh, Jesus Christ. And so the moment we have confusion, if the devil can attack marriage, he will definitely 
how these people have a false understanding of God himself. Perhaps uh, the Sabbath laws will be attacked. And so those two institutions, uh, the Sabbath and and, and, and and March, are key uh, key areas that Satan wants to attack in the last days. He wants to, as much as possible, ensure that our youth are united in a way that will not bring honor and glory to God. Now, a question was asked, hoping now that the, the person who, who inquired is in, in um has already come and and the question was asked what is the um age variance in marriage i want to answer that question straight away and you can read more and more and more and more now the issue of age variance is not an issue of is it uh sin or is it righteous it is about is it best there is an extent to which it is seen, and I will explain to you. Now, there is something that the Englishman coined and called the age group. Now, we look at this in two ways. We look at this in what says the word of God. Now, Ellen White is very clear on this, and you can look at the Bible, and you'll be able to find this in the Bible by drawing principles from examples of uh, people who got married and their age variants. Uh, um, we have uh, an example, the very first ideal marriage between Adam and Eve, you realize that one, uh, God presents the woman to the man. So it's the woman that is presented. And then what happens is, Adam is a little older than Eve. So we want to believe that from the Bible, in most cases, the man is older. And we can explain that scientifically. It's because women develop physiologically faster than men. And so we expect that ladies will have their mind mature faster, physically their bodies mature faster, they waste away faster, and also their sexual desires might actually be depressed earlier before those of men. And that is why the man is a little older so that uh, uh, just in case of anything, she can be able to be at par with the woman who is a little younger. And you'll be able to find that a woman who is a little younger than you and you'll be able to define what's a little younger because that might uh, be different depending on how you look at it. To someone, 40 is a little younger. 40 years difference to another person, two months is a little younger. We'll be able to find that. Um, um, if, for example, you have um, um, a woman uh, who is uh, of 20 years, for example, I want to use that, 20 years, that's two decades. So in a case of two decades age variance, so one is 20, another one is 30, then you have one is 20 and another one is 40. So if one is 20 and another one is 40, basically the age group of the one who is 20 is, is according to those who defined age group, is between 19 to 29. So the person who is 20 is out of the age group of the person who is 40. They don't think alike. They don't reason alike. The likes of the man who is 40 is different with the likes of the man who is what? of the lady who is actually 19. So you can be able to see the difference. So I think, and many people who've done research have found that anything outside the variance of 10 is very dangerous. Anything outside the variance of 10 is very dangerous. We are not saying it will not work, but it's very dangerous for these reasons. Especially if the lady is anything less than 20 or less than 25, and the person has over 10 years, ahead of that woman, then what will happen is this. Uh, for one, uh, the physical makeup of the lady, if the lady is young, can the lady be able to actually uh, satisfy the needs of the man? And can the man be able to satisfy the needs of the woman uh, in terms of body chemistry? Another thing you need to ask yourself is in terms of child development. Uh, will the man be able and capable to take care of the child or will the woman, if she's too old, be able to take care of your child? Because remember, if, for example, you are having your children at two years while you are 50, you're two years while you're 50, and the woman is 20 or, 
or, or 20 something, then you must ask yourself, will you be able to be a responsible father in terms of character development? I know that those who came after me, my father was very aggressive. We are seven children in our house. Our last born knows very well that our father was not strict on them as he was strict on us. So, so at least you can be able to understand from the family set up that the responsibility of parenting reduces as parents get older. So if the age variance is too big, then one of the parents who is much older will not have more uh, responsible parenting to the children, and the children may end up being AWA. So you have to look at all those factors in front of parenting in terms of actually satisfying the chemistry of your other partner, because it's not about selfish care. We don't want to look at marriage in terms of, I want to get, I don't care about my wife. I don't care about her needs in terms of uh, 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 body chemistry. I don't care about, perhaps you're going to leave the woman while she is still 30 and you're already incapable to, uh, to be able to help her through. And then this is what brings problems in marriage. Then that woman has to go outside and seek for other, maybe this, someone to fulfill her desires. And these are some of the things that have brought problems in marriage. I have seen such a case recently where about um, uh, 20, uh, about 30 year old, it's married about 50 year old man. And as we speak right now, uh, I mean, I've talked to the, the sister and I was, uh, I was just like, the man has been able to, she appeared to love the woman, but right now it's not working. Uh, he's been able to kick the woman out of the house. It's just like that. It just happened like that. Kick the woman out of the house the woman she promised that she loved so much. And and of course, there are a lot of things I will not share here, but basically it's because now uh, they are not able to agree. She feels the woman is too childish. She feels the lady is childish, she's not grown in mind. And because of that reason, she cannot. he cannot live with the woman. He feels the woman should be thinking of business and thinking of this and how can we build a house there. And she doesn't understand that probably it's because the woman is younger and they can't just think alike. They can't just think alike. It's very difficult for him to become a child and very difficult for the woman to become someone who's old enough at 50. So you can be able then your friendship. Uh, you see now, this is another thing that you need to ask. The friends of your husband and the friends to your wife. Uh, who are they? Are they the people who your wife will find freedom uh, interacting with, talking with. If your wife is 30, most of her friends, even if they are men, they are around about that age group. She freely interacts with them and vice versa. Uh, so, you, so you must be able to be in that age group where you can be able to easily interact. Now, let's go to the topic of today. I feel that question, I can answer it that shortly. But if you need a comprehensive answer, we can do a study on that. And we're looking at, well, God has called you. Are you ready? And that's the question I'm asking you. God has called you. Are you ready? We're looking at chapter 31 of the book of Proverbs. This is very important now. In chapter 31 of the book of Proverbs, it's important for us to understand. I'm reading from verse number 10. And the Bible says in verses number 10, who can find a virtuous man? Now, the same concept the Bible also brings when Solomon writes, and Solomon himself says, a faithful man, who can be able to find him? Who can find a virtuous woman? So we need a virtuous woman for us men. And women, you need a loving, faithful man. That's what the Bible says. Men, you need a virtuous, submitting woman. That's that's the brief, comprehensive description of a woman is really virtuous, submit, submitting or submissive woman, and now faithful, loving man. That's what the Bible tells us. Still, still, okay. Oh, you are probably cannot mute it because you're calling. Anyways. So, uh, verses number, who can find a virtuous woman for a price is far above ruby. So, this cannot be bought. Some of the qualities of a prepared, ready woman for marriage cannot be bought. I'll read it really quickly. 
so that you may be able to grasp a few things when you join the dots. It says in verse 11, the heart of her husband doth certainly trust in her, so that she shall have no need of spoil. Mark you, this is a prophecy. This is not just something else. Solomon is bringing a prophecy of one, the Bible says, the words of King Lamuel, the prophecy that his mother taught him. If you want to occupy the office of a king, what would your mother teach you? Just imagine that these are the words of a woman to one, King Lamuel. Because the Bible says the words of King Lamuel, the prophecy that his mother did what? What is the problem today in our church? Our mothers do not give us such prophecies. And so we want to grow into the position and responsibility of a king while we are growing in a society where the darkest ministry is dead in the church, our parents are not giving us the same prophecy and listen to the prophecy of this woman to a son whom she loves so much. She says in verses 12 that this good woman, she will do him good and not evil all the days of her life. She seeketh wood and flax and worketh willingly with her hands. Now, in Israel, manual labor was not an option, even if you are the son of the tycoon of that time. We are living in a time and age where I went to college and one of my classmates said right behind me that I cannot cook. Uh, she was a dear sister. I love her. I like her. And uh, I thought we were on an official uh, school trip and looked at her and said, you said you cannot cook for your husband. And she was basically saying, I mean, I'm going to school. And that's what people are looking for. I want that cool man, that tall guy. Uh, I want that dark guy. I want that. I mean, you know the descriptions that you all give. But no one ever said that they want the qualities that this woman is giving to her son in a prophecy. And she says that this woman seeketh wool and flax and worketh willingly with her arm. One of the qualities and attributes of someone who is ready uh, to get into marriage is they must be willing. Now, willing to work with their hands, manual labor. They are willing to sort out their things, even if they had a maid in the house. They are willing to be part and parcel of the manual work in the house. They don't have all manual labor. They don't look at it and degrade it and look at it as a work of failures. Right? Uh, they don't do that. Because these are the qualities that prepare either show if you're ready. And I'll be able to mention this in a little while. That these things are not done intentionally. They should be done when there is no attention being tapped. What I mean is they should be naturally flowing. Now, last time I see that, for example, if you realized that if you're present, there is a lady who does things extraordinarily, perhaps to please you, and if you are absent, she would not do those things, that is a red light. It's a red light. You need to stop. You just need to stop. If, for example, you were you, you was somewhere and... Uh, People are eating, and your wife was able, or rather your girlfriend was able to serve you something. You are not married. If she was able to serve you something, but never serve the rest, you're not married. That's a red light. That's a red light. Because she's done that to please you. You are not married. She would have been fair enough to do it to every single person. Uh, unless you already married. So there are a lot of things that I can show you if whether it's intentional to just tap, tap your attention as a person. Or is it something that willingly flows from our, our nerves? The Bible says uh, in verses number 14, she's like the merchant ship, she bringeth her food from afar. She rises also while it is yet night and giveth meat to her household and a portion to her maidens. She considereth her field and buyeth it and with the fruit of her hand, she planted a vineyard. She guided her loins with strength and strengthened her arms. She perceived that her merchandise is good. The candle goeth not out by night. 
She laid her hand on the spindle and her hands pulled to distal. She stretched out her hand to the poor year. She reached forth her hands to the media. That's another important thing. Is your wife someone who is host? I mean, who can be able to host people? Is hospitality hospitality part of her life? Now, I want you to understand, man, that if you're living in a house where you are more charitable than your wife, you are in trouble because you cannot bring food from the kitchen when you have guests. It is better a man who is selfish uh, than a woman who is selfish because the woman will bring the food. You will not stop her. You don't know what she's preparing in the kitchen. Now, when the woman is the one who is selfish, who doesn't like to entertain guests, and we talked about that last time, that in entertaining guests, perhaps you entertain angels. And it is in the entertainment of guests that Abraham was able to find moments to pray for his Ne uh, uh, nephew, uh, uh, I mean, not. So it's 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 very important for you to be able to check on on that aspect. That if the woman is one full of hostility, then guests will love to be in that house. A house that has a woman that is full of hostility is a house that will welcome as many guests. Your friends will be glad to visit, and that's why we say they also entertain the poor. Can they share the little that you have, the food that you have, the clothes that you have? Uh, she's not afraid of the snow for her household, for all her households are clothed with scarlet. She maketh herself coverings of tapestry and her clothing is silk and purple. Her husband is known in the gates when he sitteth among the elders of the land. She maketh fine linen and selleth it and delivereth girls unto the merchant. Strength and honor are her clothing, and shall rejoice in the time to come. This is a very important verse that I will read and stop there. It says, She openeth her mouth with wisdom, and in her tongue is the law of kindness. There are few things that actually define the office of a good and acceptable woman. The Bible says in Proverbs 19, verse 14, A prudent wife is not from your friends. A prudent wife is not found from youth seminars. A prudent wife is not found from dating groups. A prudent wife is from the Lord. That is what the Bible says. Proverbs 18.22 says, Whosoever findeth such a wife, findeth a good thing, and obtaineth the favor of the Lord. So very important there. Uh, Ellen White says in Ministry of Eating 359, paragraph 4, prudent wife is from the Lord. The heart of her husband doth certainly uh, trust in her. She will do him good and not evil all the days of her life. She openeth her mouth in wisdom, and in her tongue is the law of kindness. She looketh uh, well to the ways of her household and eateth not the bread of idleness. A prudent wife does not eat the bread of idleness. She must work hard to earn a living. Laziness is coming up amongst our youths. They, they get into marriage and still want to depend on their parents. They can't go to the farm and raise food. They are doing all these things. And here the Bible says that this woman does not eat the bread of idleness. You will find women who will go and take lands for people and earn a living. Of course, you know, it's distressing. Of course, you know that there is an extent in which manual labor becomes destructive to the physical being, that we should do it with temperance. Yet the Bible also abhors laziness, because the Bible says, whosoever does not work should not eat. So it's very important that while men are to bring food, women must also work hard. They must work hard, or uh, in order to learn also that whatsoever is brought uh, by the man is brought out of sweat. So she looked well to the ways of her household and eateth not the bread of idleness. Her children rise up and call her blessed. Her husband also and praiseth her, saying, Many daughters have done virtuously, but thou excellest them all. He who can say such a wife. Uh, he who can say such a wife findeth a good thing and obtaineth the favor, or rather, who, he who gains such a wife findeth a good thing and obtains the favor of the Lord. 
Adventist home, page 79, paragraph 3, attachments. And now, uh, these are the concepts of now, am I ready? Attachments formed in childhood have often resulted in very wretched union or in disgraceful separations. Early connections, if formed without the consent of parents, am I ready? If you are not willing to share your relationship with your parents, if you have any fears in you, you are not ready. It's a mark that disqualifies you. So it means you are not mature enough and ready to marry. A person who is ready to marry and is not moved by emotions or is not trifling acts should be very glad to share with their parents their current relationship and so uh 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 uh, uh, uh here, here here is the here is here is the point uh the point is Ellen white is saying early connections if formed without the consent of parents have seldom proved an up have proved happy the young affection should be restrained until the period arrives and sufficient age listen carefully sufficient age so age is very important you cannot be ready until you are over age that can make right decisions and experience will make it honorable and safe to unfair them so there must be sufficient age and sufficient experience so you realize that actually in the western culture people become of age and experience most of them probably at about age of 19 20 that's why you find some years got into marriage about 1920 and yet if you look at their writings from where we can judge if they were mature or they were still immature you'll find a lot of maturity in their writings in themselves for example ellen white and james white their books are so mature in counsel to the young people and so i want to believe that it's very important for us to be able to look at the age uh, and the experience that the person has in regard to the duties and responsibilities of a wife and the duties and responsibilities of a man. Those who will not be restrained will be in danger of dragging out an unhappy existence. So if you don't have that experience, and what is the experience? I asked a young lady, you are entering into marriage. Are you ready to be a woman? All right, are you ready to be a woman? Leave alone the fun that you're having with the man right now. Are you ready tomorrow to take the responsibilities of a man? This man might be sick tomorrow. Are you willing to take the responsibility of taking care of this man? This man has a mother. This man has a father. This man will be having guests. Young man, are you ready to take care of this woman? This woman has need. She needs to dress. She has parents because many men always forget the parents of the lady so that when they get married, the parents of the lady lose a daughter and the parents of the man loses a son. That's what happens in most of the marriages that we have. It's because of inexperience. We did count the cost of marriage. When you get married, when I got married, I knew I was not entering just an easy home. It was a lot of joy because God was leading me. But I understood that my responsibility was now not but to my wife and also her parents. Why? Because I understood that this woman, whom I'm now marrying, whom I'm now happy about, did not become who she is without the work of the parents, whom now I want to deny their privilege to have their daughter. So what I'm saying is, though I had a lot of difficulty in my marriage, I had a lot of difficulty, uh, I, I would give the testimony another time, because of my faith. It was because of my faith. But I did everything that was within my reach as a Christian to be able to explain to them that I respected them, I loved them, but I would not change my faith because of a woman. My wife was faithful too and stood on the ground that she would not change her faith just because the parents wanted it that way. 
but we love them and we promised them that we love them and we were respectful and we went low trying to prove to them that we are not doing this for any other reason. But I want you to understand that we understood that we had a responsibility still, a responsibility to support them, a responsibility to hear how they're doing, a responsibility to supply some of their needs. So are you ready? Are you a man of experience who can bear the responsibilities, not only of you and your wife, but also of your wife and perhaps the other, the, the parents? Now, if you are, for example, the firstborn in our family, and you are getting married, you must also understand that most probably there is a burden in that family that you will bear. Now, some have said, I don't want to marry a firstborn. It doesn't matter. If God calls you, that's not an issue. My grace is sufficient for you. It's because most of the children or people being brought up in these families will probably go through that particular house as an entrance into the life of adulthood. So from their parents, they would want to come and learn from their elder brother, from their elder sister. So just as we are told in the councils that the firstborn is very primary in terms of the development of the characters of the other children in the family. So is the first family formed in the home to the family, other families that will be formed in the home. So if you are the firstborn, for example, in the family, you bear responsibilities of trying to form, a, to build an example that will actually draw the other siblings of that particular family to Jesus Christ. So you have a heavy responsibility. So the question is, one is asking, are weddings a must? I think I'll answer that question towards the end of this presentation. Because we talk a little more about this issue of weddings, because these are, as brought people, uh, made people crazy. Uh, has made people crazy. Weddings are good, and it's, a, it's as expensive as I think, uh, what was the last thing? I think 200 shillings. Uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's as cheap as that, as expensive as that. And we can talk much about that uh, when you talk about weddings. But let's talk about this. There is a responsibility that you must be willing to bear. If you are not willing to bear the responsibility, friend, young man, young woman, you are not ready for marriage. You are not ready for marriage. Okay. Marriage is responsibility. You are taking extra responsibility. And these responsibilities you cannot do without Jesus Christ. So you must also accept that I can do all things, but only through Jesus Christ who strengthens me. So that's very important for you to remember. But yet, why is this responsibility not thought of? It is because young people are entering into marriage when they are underage or when they are inexperienced. So they are forming early union, early commitment, early affections while they are still young. We are told this is a first age. Little boys and girls commence playing at paying attention to one another when they should both be in the nursery, taking lessons in modest deportment. What is the effect of this common mixing up? Does it increase chastity in youths who thus gather together? No, indeed, it increases the first lustful passions. This is what happens in most of what you people call you people call social Sundays. I, I attended many social Sundays in the university. And I can tell you the truth, it was one of the forums that messed our understanding about family life, about forming a family and entering into marriage. There was looseness in talk. There was cheap speech. There was mingling with a lot of flighting, and it ended up in heartbreaks and so i want us to understand what ellen white is saying here as she writes to the church in volume 2 page 42 she says that boys and girls or men paying attention to one another when they should be in nursery now the concept is not literally being in nursery in terms of school but rather when they should be in the nursery where their characters and passions are still being formed they should be taking lessons of modesty and deportment, even in speech. What is the effect of this common mixing up? Does it increase chastity in the youth who thus gather together? No, indeed, it increases the lust of passions. 
This is what it does. When there is cheap mingling, when there are cheap games that people are involved in, when there is cheap in, uh, in, uh, in, I mean, uh, uh, mixing up between young people and women in these things called campuris and whatever um, youth seminars and conferences, we, we come to a point where we become proud and lose. We are told in TSB 245, the fraudness of young girls in placing themselves in the company of young men. When you bring yourself uh, 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 to a point where you see a lady who places herself, foreigners, young girls, placing themselves in the company of young men, hanging around where they are at work, entering into conversation with them, talking common, idle talk is belittling to womanhood. It lowers them, even the estimation of those who themselves do such things, both men and women. Now, you realize sometimes I don't like a lot of uh, cheap idle talk. If you see a woman who likes the company of men, I think I have that quote somewhere, who loves the company of men, whether it's in a chat forum or what, and she likes to be engaged in conversation with men, she doesn't like the company of her dear sisters, then there are all reasons to be careful as to whether that woman is the right woman who is ready for marriage. Listen to what Ellen White says in, in this next quote. Uh, you have fallen into the sad era, which is so prevalent in this degenerate age, especially with women. You are found, or rather too fond, of the other sex. Now, it does not mean you should not have an admiration of an opposite sex, for that's God's order. You should not be too fond of the other sex. You love the society, your attention to them is flattering, and you encourage to permit a familiarity which does not always accord with the exhortation of the apostle to abstain from the appearances of evil. So it's, it's important there. We are to abstain from every appearance of evil. If you see anyone who is trying to tap your attention, if you see anyone who is making roads to press closer to you than is usual, you should repulse that person. Now, Christians should learn how to actually interact in a way that glorifies God. It does not mean that we don't have the chemistry that will tell that this woman is, uh, I would say, uh, uh, this woman is a good woman who would be fit for marriage. And this man is a good man who would be fit for marriage. Now, it does, not, it does not all mean that. But interestingly, if you prayed about it, God will actually bring the two of you together without you making extra effort to prove yourself the right woman or the right man. Look at what Ellen White says in this quote. Um, she was sitting in your lap, you were kissing her, and she was kissing you. Other scenes of fondness, sensual looks, and deportment were presented before me, MR 317 we are reading. Other scenes of fondness and sensual looks and deportment were presented before me, which sent a thrill of order through my soul. Your arm and cycled the waist, and the fondness expressed was having a bewitching influence. Then a curtain was lifted, and I was shown with uh, I was shown uh, you in bed with her. And my guide said, "Iniquity." What's this that is happening here? The red and white is being shown. He's being shown uh, MR. Uh, 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 rather, we are reading from uh, one MR. Uh, if you don't mind, three twenty. Okay, uh, 378 MR 317, 8 MR 317. What is this that we are being shown or Ellen White is trying to address? I say that you don't break the barriers of principles one day. It begins by fondness and cheap talk and things like that. And then you draw closer and you begin hugging and then it moves to uh, secluding yourself and it moves from public platforms and you are dating or quoting in 
obscene environment, you are either in the dark or you are walking to places where people won't notice you. If you find that your courtship is about all that, where you don't want people to know about it, what is it that you're hiding when you're courting someone? What is it that you're hiding from your parents? What is it that you're hiding from your friends? What is it that you're hiding from the church? What is it that you are now? I'm not saying that you should go and make it a a, a news, a breaking news that uh, I, I I am in courtship with so on. So I, I'm not saying that it should be a breaking news. It's certainly not. But at the same time, those who are close to you should know that you are in a relationship. Your parents should know. Their parents should know. Their siblings should know. And when you do that, you realize that you will not make silly mistakes of looking into other women easily because you know that you know that hey look her parents know that i am committed to her and for me to go and make that commitment i must be myself committed and serious about the marriage however if i do uh, i have a hidden agenda and I am entering into courtship while I am not very sure that I'm ready for marriage, it's very possible that after three days I will be dissatisfied with that courtship and I will break it up. And I don't care about the lady or the man, what it feels. I break the heart of this woman, I break the heart of another woman, I break the heart of another woman. In the, in, 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 I mean, under, under, under the thought that I'm trying to find the right woman for myself not thinking about the emotional distress that, that I am causing others to go through. So it's very important that we look into a courtship that is open, a courtship that does not have this obscene environment where we are either in a bar, and we could be Christians and so not in a bar, but we are seeking darkness and perhaps not only darkness, but we are seeking to be in... Uh, and a natural atmosphere. We don't like public uh, public gardens. We don't like to be in public places of recreation. We want to be in private places of recreation and in rooms alone. That's a very long courtship. And if you're in courtship like that, you have question marks that you need to be raising right now. Is this a courtship that is leading to honor and glory of God? Before you get married, you have done enough sin and you'll be having uh, sins to confess. So if, if, if you are perhaps uh, your, your, your best couples would be asking you, do you have sins to confess before we, uh, we perhaps uh, uh, help you through your marriage? Uh, it's very important for us to be as much as possible open when we are quoting. And this actually will help us to guard against certain things we will not be putting ourselves in a situation which Ellen White says, and the Bible says, um, uh, would lead into temptation, uh, but rather we will be abstaining from, from evil, right? Um, this is important for you to note. Um, Ellen White also says, um, trifling with acts. Men who are ready, women who are ready must not trifle with any art. To trifle with arts is a crime of no small magnitude in the sight of a holy God. And yet some will show preference from young ladies and call out their attention or affection. So it happens especially the younger people, the younger female in the church and in the society. And their hearts are trifled by being promised art. I said last time, you promise them art you are unaware you are other friends and people will be living. And yet some will show preference to young ladies and call their out their affection. And then go their way and forget all about the words they have spoken and their effect. A new face attracts them and they repeat the same words devoted, uh, devote to another the same attention. So they promise you heaven and after a few days, they forget about every promise they gave to you. Move to another sister. It's common with men. Now it's there. The boy child is suffering as the uh, dad child. And, and so yesterday it was sister X. And after a few days, it's no longer sister X. It's sister Y. 
and sister Y is again betrayed by sister Z. What is this that is happening amongst the children of God? That hearts are broken, that there is trifling in the church. I saw a gentleman who would break almost every heart of every single first year who came into college. Everyone would be complaining about it. And I was like, what's really wrong with church members that they can never stay with one woman? Now, I want you to understand one thing. There is no miracle that happens on the day of wedding. If you finally get married to a man who has been trifling with the hearts of women, there is no miracle that happens by simply uttering words. Just like I've known that when you are in the baptismal fount of river, the words that I utter and the ordinance, that won't change anything in the, in, in, in the client that is being baptized. Actually, the client might feel the, the moments are solemn and holy. And yet, if they had not been converted before, we'll do the very same thing we used to do immediately after baptism. You see, brothers and sisters, the ordinance at the podium does not change anything in the woman. The white gown does not change anything in you. The nice suit and tie does not change anything in you. The pastor who officiates the wedding does not change anything in you. The occasion and the reception does not change anything in you. If you've been trifling with the hearts, as I've always mentioned to women who are entering into a marriage that already someone is into, then if you're coming in as a second wife, you must know of a surety that you will also have a second wife to yourself. In other words, what I mean is, you are a second wife, but as though you are first wife, there will be another wife who will be brought to replace the affection which was once given to you. And so you need to understand that the same thing that is being shown you today and being denied another woman will actually be shown to another woman and be denied. So this the basic character principles that if we don't train ourselves while we are yet young and before we enter into marriage, we will not undo. And so there is a character that we have to build in the courtship that we pass on into marriage. If we don't build it in courtship and play games with courtship, thinking that when I get married, I will never play games with women again. There are men whom have had say, the moment I get married, I will be faithful. I'll not go out with any other woman. I'll not sleep with any other woman. I'll be very faithful to my wife. Those are words if you cannot express them before or during your courtship. They are mere words now which you can break any time. So this is very important because you need to understand that by the time you stand on the podium and take that vow that I will be faithful to this woman till death do us part in disease, sickness, in poverty, you need to be thinking that these vows I'm taking, tomorrow this man might be in reality poor. Tomorrow this man might be in reality sick. Tomorrow this woman might be in reality not as beautiful as she looks right before me today. Tomorrow this woman might not be fitting in her dresses like she fits right now. Tomorrow this woman might not be able to even cook a very sweet food as she used to cook because of some situation. And so what will you do? Would you be thinking about those things while you are taking those vows? Well, there is no miracle that happens. It's what we are in courtship that we pass on to marriage. All right? Okay. As we wind up, I want us to think about this. That Ellen White continues. So trifling of heart. Because the Bible says love is patient, 1 Corinthians 13. Love is patient, love is kind and not jealous. Love does not brag. Love is not arrogant. Does not act unbecomingly. It does not seek its own. That is why we realize that love is not selfish. It is giving rather than receiving. It does not seek its own. It is not provoked easily. Uh, we realize that if a man is easily provoked, is a man is someone who does not uh, control his temper. Uh, you have all reasons to be careful, woman. 
Because if you are dating a man and you realize you are late by 30 minutes and it was a test on his patience and his anger and that man got mad and lifted his hand on you, then you might better be careful. Now let me give you a story before I pray. Now I find this woman and I gave this story already. Yes, but it's good. No, no worries repeating. Uh, uh, this woman was young enough in, uh, I think, 25, 26. And uh, this woman was married to a good church member. And she would say, I mean, uh, uh, the man loved her, but by, by, by her uh, judgment. And when they got into marriage, things did not work. They got married today and after the wedding, I mean, the lady was sharing this in front of me. In the elder's office, I'm seated there and we are talking and people are coming, I'm doing a week, and people are coming and sharing and she's come to share with me. Tears are rolling down her eyes. What has happened? And she told me, I'm married to a preacher in the church. So don't think that if I'm a preacher, it's all a qualification of a good husband. So this is what happened. She told me, day one, we've just done the wedding. We've gone to the reception and we've just gone to the hotel. He came down the next morning from our room, sat in the hotel. We were moving to another hotel elsewhere. I'll not mention the place. He shouted at me. Now, he didn't know that women get late. Women delay. Now, it's something I've been learning for you since I got married. How to be patient with women. Uh, I mean, I don't know about perhaps Brother Sam will tell me. Uh, 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 it's something I'm learning. My wife knows that I'm trying to really learn patience when it comes to issues of women ever having something to do and a little late, I hope they will improve so that our patients can be proved right. Uh, so what was happening is um, um, she felt the woman was very late and so she sh he shouted at the woman, this is his wife, he just got married yesterday. I mean, the man could not be a little patient. And then they moved over to the next hotel and in the next hotel, uh, something happened. They were not in good terms. He realized the man was furious. The man was angry. He didn't understand. She didn't understand. And so she woke out of her bed and she sat. And while she sat down, she was just chatting now with her phone, I think. And that brought a disagreement. You can see useless. I call it a foolish mistake that we sometimes make. It's a mistake over mistake. And so what happens is the man woke up, took the phone, and broke the phone. You're not talking about one week. You're talking about day two, day three, day four. The phone is already broken. There's already a shout. There's already a laying of hands onto the woman and so on. And the woman is asking, give me money. I return to my mother. Where was the mistake? Return to your mother when you are in a, from a honeymoon? That's crazy. This is the man that loved her to the extent that she didn't even have any money for the wedding. All the money was given to the man. She trusted the man that much. But then in talking to her, she told me that this man had shown these signs in courtship. There is a day she had moved to a trip with her girlfriends, a fellow girlfriends, the lady, when she came right at the roadside in the city. And she was just going to hug the, 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 the boyfriend and he shouted at her as to why he went and become too offended and angry. But she assumed that is a question. He will change. She didn't know that the wedding vows, the altar does not make any change. Only Christ can make change in the hearts of men. And to prove a faithful man, 
was not to be a work or a responsibility of after marriage or after vows. It was his responsibility to prove that he was a man who would be uh, humble, a man who would control his passions and who would control his emotions while they were quoting. So if a man cannot prove those things while he's quoting, he cannot prove to be responsible. A woman cannot Prove if we are ready. Can you control your emotions? Can you be able to? I was just talking about considering God. You cannot even meet and pray. Just because the lady has accepted that, well, we can get into engagement. You forgot all about God. It's all about the woman. And the man, the woman, it's all about the man. If you do not see these things, if you are not experienced enough, you are not of age enough, you are not committed enough to take the responsibilities of life, to take care of children, to be able to take care of your parents, both the parents of the man, love them and help the man to love them, the parents of the lady, love them and help the woman to love them. If you are not willing and ready to do these things, if these things are not right in you, you are not ready for marriage, sir. You are not ready for marriage, madam. You are still in a nursery and you need to learn lessons of deportment, lessons of uh, house responsibilities and house duties. You need to learn lessons of parenting. You need to learn lessons of emotion control. We don't need childish people. We don't need babies in marriage. All right, I know you call yourself baby and you call, well, that's okay. And that's a nice name, I think. And it's fine. It might be nice and romantic. That's okay. But if you're going to be a baby in reality, in marriage, you are not ready for marriage. You still need to be nursery and learn the ABC of marriage. We still need to be there. And, and don't, don't feel offended to be there. Stay there long enough. Long enough until you feel that, God, I think I've learned some of these lessons. I can bear a little longer with the impatience of my wife. Right? I can bear a little longer with the lateness of my wife. I can bear a little longer with the, uh, some of the nasty things that my husband could be doing, uh, which are not right. Uh, if you cannot bear a little longer with them, then you are not ready for marriage. You are not ready for marriage. So get to work, get to know. Another responsibility I didn't mention is if a woman does not know how to cook good food, She's not ready for marriage. I mean, the last thing that you want to put under the care of a maid is the food that your husband eats. Seriously. The husband is physical, the way he looks, his strength, is everything, is what he eats. So I think that it's important for you to be able to check on the concept, or idea rather, of, of, of cookery. If you don't know how to cook, Go to a cooking school and be educated on how to cook. But also, man, your wife might not be the best cook. You might have eaten sweeter food from other people, but you must always be that person who will praise their wife and make them feel that they are the best cook. The greatest mistake you want to make in marriage is to try to compare your wife whom you've married with another man's wife or another lady. That's the last thing you want to do. Keep all the other good things. 
you have witnessed outside there. Keep it all there. Don't you ever try to take that outside there. Put it on your back. Come. How I wish you were cooking a uh, soup to help them see how sweet food is prepared. Or you are probably to take them into a place where they can learn how to cook without necessarily. Telling them they are not doing very well. So these are very wisdom wisdom you know how we pray that god in heaven will help us to be better prepared that after it is his will for us that we will ourselves be sure that we are prepared to enter into it may god help us bless us i hope to answer those questions next week god willing Holy Father in heaven, I marriages yes, which are struggling because we didn't do some things right. You have encouraged us to of us who are listening now is more of little heaven down here help your children who are struggling with this concept of how to balance the principles the bible is laying out and the desires of the flesh i know our greatest enemy to doing your will are the feelings of the flesh but lord you have promised us that you you can help us to put all these things under subjection. That the principles of heaven may rule in our hearts. That love may fail us, that we may be able to give out love. I'm praying, Lord, that you may make families of people who believe the truth of this time, who are keeping your commandments and having the name of Jesus Christ to be an example to the world. I pray for that young man who is seeking to enter into marriage and that young lady is seeking to enter into marriage that tonight, Lord, you may answer their prayer. It's our prayer by faith in Jesus Christ's name. Amen.